Hey everyone, this is Josh with a fun tutorial for you today. In this video, we're going to be talking about fighting. But no, I'm not talking about heading down to the martial arts gym and training with your friends. In this video, we're going to be discussing how to fight phishing a common tactic used by hackers to gain access to private information, systems, or even money. In this video, I'm going to show you several real-world examples of phishing emails that I've received and broken down. We're going to talk about some of the most common tactics that phishers use in order to gain what they want from their victims. And most importantly, we're going to discuss several tactics for how to fight back. We're going to learn several key things that you can do to spot phishing and prevent yourself from becoming a victim of these attacks. Our first example in this series covers the tactic of urgency. In this particular example, I received an email from someone claiming to be Namecheap support, um, threatening to suspend my domains for my websites within 24 hours if I didn't log in and manually make a payment and update my payment information. In actuality, this email contained a link to a fake login page uh, that would, I'm assuming, collect my login information so that attackers could then try to log into my Namecheap account and take over my domains. I find this example to be particularly interesting because I almost fell for it. Um, but some fish fighting tactics help save me here. And I'm going to talk about some ways that you can help fight the tactic of urgency uh, that fishers use. So the first thing that helped save me here um, from falling victim to this phishing attack was avoiding uh, clicking on any links within the email itself. Instead, I went directly to the Namecheap website um, just by navigating to Namecheap.com in my browser instead of using that link uh, that was sent in that email. Uh, this saved me from entering my login information, my username and password on the fake form, which could have been used to take over my account. Uh, this is a really helpful tactic when dealing with phishing. Um, you can make links look legitimate within the body of an email, but they'll actually take you to a malicious website. And so if you're skeptical about an email that you get and there's uh, an email saying there's something wrong with your account, um, if you're worried about that, you can always go directly to that site um, and verify that everything is okay. And in this case, I was a little bit suspicious because I knew I had some auto renew and some funds and things set up in my account. Um, so I just went directly to the site to verify that everything was in fact okay and that this was a phishing attempt. Another tactic you can use to fight uh, urgency is to consider the source. And that means looking at directly where that email or text message or phishing message came from. Uh, sometimes the fishers are a little bit lazy and the fact that this is a fake source is clearly visible in the from field of the email. Um, in this particular example, um, they didn't update the from field from the email and it was coming from somebody else's taken over web, uh, website domain. So that can be a fairly reliable way to detect phishing is just look and if, if the email um, that it's sent from is not the one that you're expecting, it might be a phishing attempt. Now that said, um, email is not the most secure form of messaging and it is possible for attackers to fake the from field, um, doing what we call spoofing uh, the source to look like it's coming from something like support at namecheap.com when in fact it's coming from some other web server. Um, if you are technically savvy, you can look at the email headers um, using your email software. Something like Outlook will allow you to do this. Um, some webmail providers will allow you to do this. So you can actually see where the true source is. That does require a little bit more technical skill, um, but it's worth verifying if it's something important to you. 
The second tactic we'll cover here is the tactic of threats. And this is very common and really goes hand in hand with urgency. In this particular example, uh, I've received an email that said my trust wallet will be deactivated and my funds locked or seized if I don't verify my wallet. Threats often come with urgency because scammers, fishers, attackers, whatever you want to call them, want you to be both scared and in a hurry. When you're scared and in a hurry, you're more likely to give up private information without thinking through the consequences. You know, in this case, nobody wants to lose access to money, but if you were to go to this phishing form and enter your seed phrase, you would in fact be giving the attackers access to all of your money. In cryptocurrency, your seed phrase uh, grants access to all of the coins stored in that wallet. It's the private keys for everything. And so fishers love to try to get you to give up that seed phrase in a hurry. In this case, with the threat that your wallet is going to be locked. So a great tactic to use when it comes to threatening phishing emails is just to take a step back and evaluate the threat logically. Is it actually a realistic threat? In this case, uh, for one thing, I don't use that particular wallet software, so that very clearly is an empty threat. But uh, even assuming if I did use that wallet software, Trust Wallet is a non-custodial crypto wallet, meaning that the user has the keys to their cryptocurrency through that seed phrase. And as long as you have the keys, nobody can freeze your funds with a non-custodial wallet. Somebody can freeze an exchange account, like a Coinbase or a Binance or a Gemini, but if a wallet gives you a seed phrase and they were to try to freeze your wallet for some reason, maybe their servers go offline, you can just import that seed into another wallet and still send the coins on the blockchain. So in this case, logically, that's an empty threat. By taking a step back for a moment, and realizing that nobody can actually lock a non-custodial wallet, um, we can stop ourselves from giving up our seed phrase in a hurry, being scared that we're going to lose money. Um, because in reality, if we give an attacker our seed phrase, we'll lose that money. Another example, and this is one that I've seen a lot lately, that also covers the tactic of threats, is the blackmail email. Um, these can be quite scary and quite sophisticated. In this situation, somebody claims that they've um, compromised our device, our laptop, our phone, whatever that we're using. They claim that they have full access to our device and they have um, embarrassing videos of us in our private life. And so... What they do then is they threaten you and say, I'm going to release this video to all of your contacts that I have because I've compromised your system unless you pay me in cryptocurrency. Um, and cryptocurrency is irreversible. So if you send that money, there's no way to get it back when you realize it's just a scam. Again, we can evaluate this threat logically and understand that it's an empty threat. First of all, um, in most cases, unless you're like downloading torrents or you're navigating to really shady websites, day-to-day -day browsing software that you use on a computer is unlikely to be malicious. And um, modern OS's antivirus can generally prevent um, serious takeovers of devices. That's not to say that it doesn't happen because malware is absolutely a serious threat. But it's, it's fairly unlikely that somebody would have full access to your system with very, very sophisticated malware that the, that the OS didn't detect. And that said, um, if they really did have full access, they're probably not going to send you an email and try to extort you for money. They would log into your bank account um, and transfer themselves money. They would steal cryptocurrency seed phrases and just steal the coins in there. Um, they're probably not going to go through the steps of alerting you to the compromise 
and then trying to extort money from you. The only reason that they're extorting you, threatening you, trying to blackmail you into giving them money is because they don't actually have access to your device. They want you, again, to be scared, in a hurry, feeling threatened in order to give them what they want. Now, you know, too, sometimes these blackmail scams uh, use some interesting tactics. They'll use that spoofing where they um, make the email look like it came from your own email address. And sometimes, too, they'll use passwords that have previously been leaked in data breaches that have been cracked. Um, so maybe if you don't have the best password hygiene, you're reusing passwords, weak passwords, you might see your password there in the body of the email and think, wow, I really have been hacked. Um, when in reality, this is from another data breach and sort of, you know, needing to update your password and not reuse it is a, is a separate issue uh, than having your device fully compromised. The third tactic, which is of course something that we all love, is the tactic of rewards. Um, free money, free items, giveaways of some sort. In this particular example, um, this is a cryptocurrency airdrop. So um, they're offering you free cryptocurrency in exchange for doing uh, one of two things. Um, either connecting your wallet and signing a um, smart contract using a wallet connect or some other contract signing method, or they're asking you to send money um, to a cryptocurrency address in order to quote unquote verify your wallet um, with the promise that they'll send you double that back. And in both cases, what's actually going to happen is either your wallet's going to be drained by a malicious contract, or you've just sent them cryptocurrency to verify your wallet, which is irreversible, and they just take that money and run. Um, and in this case, what we want to think about is being wary of too good to be true rewards. Does someone really want to send you thousands of dollars in free money? Um, probably not. I mean, there are very altruistic people in the world, but they're likely not sending out blast emails and just sending money to random strangers rather than charitable giving or, you know, very specific philanthropic efforts. Um, they're probably not just going to send you money. So if a stranger is sending you an email and it's somebody you don't know and they're offering you thousands of dollars in money, you should be immediately suspicious. The next thing is is you should never send money to get money um, or give out private information to get money. You know, these giveaway scams are, are ultimately trying to extract either money or private information that will ultimately lead to money for the scammers, whether that be a seed phrase, signing a malicious smart contract, or you just out and out sending them cryptocurrency. So never ever send somebody money to get money. If somebody truly wants to do a cryptocurrency giveaway, all they need is your public address. And a public address is just that. It's public. You can put it on a billboard, you can give it to anybody, and that can't be used to take money out of your wallet. It can only be used to send money to you. So again, be wary of these too good to be true scenarios. So in summary, these are a couple phishing tactics that we commonly see that trick people into giving out private information or money. We have urgency, threats, and the promise of rewards. And there's a couple really key tactics that we can use to fight phishing. We can take the time to evaluate what's going on. Is this a valid threat? Is this a too good to be true reward? We can also consider the source. Make sure an email is actually coming from where you expect it to. Avoid directly clicking on links inside a phishing message and go directly to the source. By using these sorts of tactics, we can fight back against phishing. Because ultimately, phishing relies on tricking the human rather than breaking a system. People, we get scared, 
we you know are in a hurry when we have busy lives and we get greedy we love free things we love rewards and you know fishers are all using those sort of base human instincts to trick us into giving them what they want our private information our money any other type of credentials that they can use for their own gains so taking the time to slow down and evaluate these phishing messages can save you from a lot of pain as always i hope you found this tutorial interesting and informative and thank you very much for learning something new with me today